everyone today for uh, for joining us uh, for this event. My name is Jonathan Bidlack. I'm the head of the governance program at the R Street Institute. Uh, we have what I think is a very interesting program today. Uh, you know, obviously the topic of electoral reform and, and the November election has been on many people's minds for the last few months. And uh, I think there are a lot of ideas that are being talked about uh, in the state uh, for reform. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that today. But I think you know, the, um, what we're going to start off with is, is talking a little bit about where the electorate is and specifically where the Republican electorate is. Um, obviously, you know, Donald Trump lost the election in November, um, but Republicans did, did better than expected in the House and even in the Senate. And so, um, you know, it's, it's quite interesting, I think, and, and, and worth starting to uh, actually let the data do the talking as to, uh, you know, how, how voters feel about the electorate. Uh, with us today is Ryan Tyson. Uh, Ryan is the, the president of the Tyson Group. Um, they conducted uh, the poll that, uh, along with the R Street Institute of the Republican electorate, I think it is quite possibly the most detailed poll to date, uh, or at least since the election, uh, about where the Republican electorate stands. And so um, we're just going to start off by doing a, uh, a summary of, of that polling data and, and talking through it. Uh, for anyone who does have questions, there is the Q&A function in, the, uh, in, in Zoom, so feel free to drop a question there and I will uh, work to ask those during the course of our program. Uh, toward the second half, we're actually going to have uh, Steve Greenhut, a uh, resident senior fellow at R Street, join us. Uh, Steve is the co-author uh, of a, a new paper that R Street has put out uh, called The Case Against Restricting Voting Access, um, which actually argues for uh, for some reforms. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Steve's, uh, Steve's paper, as well as where uh, you, know, you know, talk about some of these reforms in the context of the polling data that we're going to see in the first half of our program. So uh, with that, I think, Ryan, if you want to if you want to kick it off and uh, uh, and start walking through the data, that'd be great. And I'll, I'll make sure to ask questions as we go along. Absolutely. Thank you, Jonathan. And I hope everybody can see the screen. This was an exciting project to work on uh, briefly about the sample. Twelve hundred Republican voters were, were sampled nationwide. But what we also did was did an additional 300 completes in the swing states that have been in play and, and made a lot of news um, through the Electoral College. So Arizona, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. We had an additional 300 interviews within each of those states. So total of 3,000 people we spoke to uh, in this live telephone survey. Uh, and, and as Jonathan said, the data was absolutely eye-opening. Uh, sobering in many ways, but it was it very it illuminated a lot of the sentiments that we assumed were out there, and we were able to to uh, wrap our hands around um, some very fascinating things that are happening within the electorate. We'll briefly go over the sample details as it relates to the regional breaks of this. So, uh, when you see Northeast, you can see the states that we're highlighting in the South, the Midwest, the Mountain states, as well as Pacific. When you're dealing with Republican-only voters, just under 40%. Uh, of the voters we talked to come from the Southeast. So that, that makes sense. Most of the voters that are Republican, uh, not all these states have a uh, party registration, obviously. So a lot of this has to be self id but you are essentially looking from the Rockies to the East where you get most of the interviews um, that are in this survey. So we're not gonna go through everything that was in this sample package, in this package, but the most relevant things we will. And we start with the most obvious. Do you support or oppose alternate methods of voting such as vote by mail or the use of drop boxes due to the pandemic? Overwhelming opposition by Republicans nationwide. I think anybody that is a Republican instinctually knows that this is true. 75% oppose, 65% strongly oppose. So anytime we're looking at polling, if you see the intensity, uh, be it strongly support or strongly oppose in this instance, go over 40%, we say that that's an intense measure. You're at 65% intensity, so I would say that this is a very passionate feeling that Republicans have uh, as it relates to these alternate voting met methods. A couple of things I will point out inside of the internals of this. Uh, you'll notice that at the top uh, of the table, you'll see Arizona, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania are broken out. Overall, minus 53 on the net. Uh, is where the opposition is when you compare it to, uh, when you compare support to opposition, but it's worse when you get into these swing states, and that kind of makes sense. Republicans in North Carolina, minus 60. Georgia, minus 64. Wisconsin, minus 66. Pennsylvania, minus 65. Not as bad in Florida, but Donald Trump won Florida, so that is kind of logical, uh, perhaps. And then in Arizona, we didn't see uh, anywhere near that level of opposition uh, as well. Uh, only uh, on the opposite side, only thing I would point out is in the mountain region is that 38% uh, 
of those that we sampled inside of the mountain region, Republicans inside of that region, uh, did support the alternate methods that, that were out there, only minus 19 on the net there. Ryan, can I ask you a quick question on that? I know you've I know you've polled you know on on this topic before, and I wonder if you might be able to give any any sense of how that how this particular uh, information is or, or question might have looked over time. You know, do you do you have a sense of you know maybe a year ago where the Republican electorate might have might have been compared to where it is today? Great question. So we actually were in the field right at the beginning of the pandemic uh, in, in several states as it relates to voting methods, because when the pandemic originally started, you were in late March, early April. The question was, well, how are you going to vote? I mean, are you going to be more of a mail voter, more of an in-person voter? And as far back as a year ago, it was very clear on ideology that Republicans wanted to vote in person. Um, so the more there was talk about mail and, and so-called drop boxes and anything else other than what really is traditional in-person voting, we were seeing a very clear distinction on that. Uh, so Republicans, long before Donald Trump lost this election, were very much lining up uh, uh, to see a lot of limits in these alternate methods of voting that we're discussing here. I, I hope that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next uh, follow-up question that we asked the voters was, do you think the alternate, al alternative methods open the process to increased error mismanagement or fraud that could have changed the outcome of a presidential election. 92% of the sample said yes, 77% said definitely yes. Very little distinction when you go throughout all of the internals with the minor exception of self-ID moderates that are, are Republicans that are moderate. They only made up roughly 6% of the sample, but all across the board, there is widespread agreement that these alternate methods likely opened up the process, uh, opened up opened up the election process uh, that could have changed the outcome of the election. And I think that's really important to, to, to wrap our hands around, that the Republican base truly feels that these alternative methods of voting changed the outcome of the election some way, somehow. Very important to point this out and keep this context um, as we move forward. Ryan, let me ask you a question that uh, that someone went and uh, proposed in the chat, which is that, you know, it, do you think that part of the opposition here is due to characterization of alternate voting methods during the pandemic versus asking a question that helps to normalize these methods? Uh, I, I think that uh, you'll see here shortly in states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, where there weren't so many, it, it appears, alternate methods of voting. Uh, I, I would I would answer the question that that Republicans want to see in person voting and that be the primary way that they vote. So if these alternate methods are anything other than that, you're going to see a, them not be open to that. Um, I, I if I understand the question correctly, um, I, I, I can you read that one more time? I want to make sure I'm answering. That sure. Question. Yeah, they said they, they wonder if part of the opposition is due to characterization of alternate voting methods during the pandemic versus asking a question that helps to normalize these methods. We're going to ask questions here in a second about these methods, and I think you'll see they're not normalized. So we take it out of the generic description of alternate voting methods because I, if I, I feel like I see the point, which is characterizing them as such may make them a boogeyman of the unknown. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that voters know in these states how they voted prior to the pandemic. And they know that all of the, the ways that were introduced due to the pandemic are so-called, you know, excused uh, because of the pandemic. They don't trust them. And you'll see that here in a minute as we go through several of them. I hope that answers the question. Mm -hmm. Validity of the election. Um, and regardless of who you voted for, do you think the 2020 election result for president was valid? 67% of those surveyed said no. 55% of the uh, of those sam Republican sampled nationwide said definitely no. Uh, when you look at uh, uh, the, the ver several of the internals on this survey, minus 44 yes to no is the overall sample. When you look into some of these key swing states, it gets even worse. Arizona minus 56, North Carolina minus 51, Florida minus 55, Wisconsin minus 52, Pennsylvania is almost about where the rest of the country is at minus 48. You can see very conservatives climb up to minus 58. So it's very clear uh, that, that widespread belief that the election result for president was not valid. Now, one thing I will tell you that we learned in a subsequent focus group is that the definition of valid does seem to have some fluidity to it. Uh, a lot of voters don't 100% know. Uh, we, they may not, not have the same definition of what valid means, 
But I do think even with that understanding, large widespread agreement amongst Republicans that their election results simply wasn't valid. We asked the self id question of these voters, which of the following best describes how you voted in the 2020 general election? 48%, half the sample, said that they voted on election day, compared to 28% saying that they used early voting, and 24% saying that they used mail-in voting. When you look at the states, you can see where, you can start to see a pattern where some of the states clearly didn't have as many early voting options. Uh, say, as you'll see here in the deep south and on the next slide in a second. So, for example, uh, Arizona, 26% chose election day. That's a lot less than what you saw overall. Um, you see uh, a lot more mail-in voting at 52% in the state of Arizona. But then you get into North Carolina, you see a much bigger influence on early voting at 57%. In Georgia, the same, 52% of Republicans saying they voted early. In Florida, it climbs down to 45%. But then you see Wisconsin and Pennsylvania a lot, lot lower, not necessarily in mail-in either. They're not necessarily voting by mail either. They went to election day in these states. So Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, 66, 83 percent respectively. Um, and those are really the, the, the biggest distinctions that we saw within the swing states when comparing uh, to the rest of the, the, the sample. Now, Ryan, we um, we got a, yep. we got a couple questions about yep. the uh, the validity of the election, and they're, they're similar. Yep. And it's basically about the role of President Trump. Um, yep. And you know, did it, I guess the first question is whether or not you think that Republicans would have been as strongly opposed uh, if if the president hadn't been using the messaging that he did. And the second question is, you know, how do you think? And this is again, I perhaps not knowable, but uh, you know, how do you think these results would have looked if if President Trump had won? Do you have any any way of answering that from from the data? So, okay, so I can see these questions now. So I'd say the first question is, uh, uh, I, I would say if Trump wasn't obviously, you know, his messaging was different, I think this would be, a, a, you know, different, obviously, that's, that's logical. Um, I think on the second question, uh, would the level of belief that the election was invalid be the same if Trump had won? Of course not. <laughs> I mean, it, it would definitely not be that way. Uh, you, you know, one of the things that we talked to with Jonathan and uh, you, you about when I briefed you on this initial survey, Jonathan and I talked about how it would be nice to know how Democrats felt at the end of 2016. So like, what if we did this project in late January of 2017? What would Democrats have thought? Probably the same. They probably thought the election was stolen. They probably didn't think the results were valid. Clearly, there's something that had to have been wrong. We won't know because nobody did something like this uh, that, that I'm aware of, at least that was public um, at that time. So uh, good, good questions. And, and I think the answers are fairly logical on, on, on both points. Looking briefly at vote method by region, fascinating here, uh, you can see how the geographic trends change uh, throughout the country. So rem a reminder, overall, 48% of the sample voted on election day, 28% voted early, 24% voted by mail or absentee, depending on the verbiage they used. 70% of those in the Northeast said they voted on election day, um, compared to 9% saying early, 21% saying mail-in. And then look in the Deep South, uh, you see only 44% say election day, but 43% voted early and in person, only 12% uh, saying that they voted by mail. The Midwest, even higher on the emphasis uh, on voting on election day. The only outliers, the mountains to the west, that mountain region in the Pacific, where you see a much heavier reliance on mail-in voting. Uh, and my belief on that is there just wasn't that many in-person options uh, in the mountain and definitely in the Pacific coast. And you'll see that here in a minute, uh, some of these distinctions on these individual voting methods, because several of these places and these states and those regions have been voting heavier by mail over the years for quite some time anyway. And it's logical when you see that show up in these follow-up data questions. So we have a question here. 60 court cases rejecting claims about election fraud suggest that the election process was appropriate. Uh, I'd say that that's what it, uh, so the question is, do you think that 60 court cases rejecting claims about election fraud suggest that the election process was appropriate? It might be for the legal scholars, but that's not who we survey here. These are voters. And these voters are very passionate about their beliefs. The lawyers be damned. Something had to have been wrong. Uh, that's how I would answer that question. Make sure we're very clear that these, these voters think the entire system is corrupt. Doesn't matter what a bunch of judges and justices say. Um, not that I share that belief. It's what clearly is the belief. 
of these uh, the votes we sampled. So we followed up of the folks who said they voted by mail, and remember, by for context, only 24% of the sample voted by mail. So only 292 uh, uh, completes of the 1,200 overall had voted by mail. What we found is half of them said that they typically vote uh, by mail, but 47% said uh, this was definitely their first time. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the individual states, you can see 82% of those who vote by mail in Arizona typically do it anyway. You look at a state like Florida, it's 73% as well. These are states that have more routine vote by mail. Whenever you compare to a state like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, those numbers are much, much lower, 37 and 38, uh, saying that they typically vote by mail were 58 and 60 comparatively, they say first time ever. Um, you'll also notice regionally in the geographics that in the, those in the mountain and the Pacific region, they also, uh, the ones that vote by mail, it's something that they had done uh, typically and they've done it for quite some time. Uh, question is, if election fraud happened for the presidential race, how did it not affect down ballot races? How can the Republicans explain this? We have to stop trying to ascribe logic to this, okay? That's not the purpose of the exercise. These Republicans are telling us how they feel about the election result. I think if you try to start throwing logic at them, I don't know that you're necessarily going to get the kind of answers that, that, that you want. Um, but yes, I think that question is very much valid. How, how is it that in a state like Arizona, if there's all this fraud, Republicans just destroy down ballot? How do the Republicans pick up all these congressional seats around the country um, if uh, uh uh, if that had happened, I think we all know the answer to that. I mean, there clearly wasn't as much fraud as there they say that there was, or they wouldn't have had these gains, um, would be the logical answer. But they would probably push back and say, well, yeah, they, they only focused on the top ticket races anyway. The, the fraud didn't vote down ballot. So this could go back and forth for quite some time. Then this is where uh, uh, the paradox of these voters is going uh, all over the place. We asked them individually, were you satisfied or dissatisfied with the process of casting your ballot this election? So here you've got these voters telling us that the election result for president wasn't valid. The alternate methods of voting had opened up all these processes. There could be mismanagement and fraud and whatnot, but yet 86% of the sample were satisfied with the process by which they cast their own ballots this election. 66% said they were very satisfied. The only outlier that we see is in the Pacific region where 31% were very dissatisfied. I would have a hunch that that probably has to do with how little in-person voting options were available on that side of the country um, uh, during the election. So once again, just, just seeing how they're, they're kind of all over the place uh, when we do this analysis, they believe that they were, they were completely satisfied with how they cast their own ballots, but clearly everybody else must have had a problem because the president said so or certain media or whatnot. <clears throat> we then asked the question, when it comes to reforming our elections process, please listen to the following list of public officials and tell me if you find them trustworthy or untrustworthy. Went through all of these lists of officials. Remember, this is a little bit dated because it came back right at the beginning of February. You can see Donald Trump sits at the top at plus 76. His intensity of trustworthy was at 57. Um, 86.10 trustworthy uh, uh, to untrustworthy. Mike Pence coming just underneath them at plus 72 at an 82.10. You then see Marco Rubio comes in underneath plus 50, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, Fox News personalities, generic local supervisor and congressman. Nikki Haley doesn't have as much uh, awareness, 38% of the sample, um, having no opinion one way or the other about her. But then you come down to Mitch McConnell, who at the time of this survey was plus four, doubt he's there after his comments on the impeachment. Uh, and then Mitt Romney was upside down even before the impeachment process or the second impeachment process. <clears throat> had started. Ryan, you um you mentioned that some of those results obviously have changed since then. You, you know, do you have a sense? I mean, I think you, you know the one that might be particularly interesting is is Mike Pence. I mean, you saw the the CPAC straw poll this weekend, which is of course the most conservative activist. I believe Mike Pence, regardless of whether Donald Trump was included in the in the straw poll, you know, getting one percent support. So, you know, have you seen any data, I guess, with respect to him that might suggest that you know his his favorables or trustworthiness in this context have gone down, and and just generally, you know, who else in here might it might have changed? I haven't seen any data because there has, I haven't, I haven't had the need to measure that, but I think we all know instinctively that after, uh, uh, you know, 
the impeachment process and after a lot of the words that the president said about uh, Vice President Pence um, in the lead up, his numbers on trustworthiness managed to survive the January 6th crisis. Um, I would imagine that 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 there's a pretty short half-life on these numbers. And I do think that he's out of sight, he's out of mind. I would imagine rapidly you'll see that start to go down and move to more uninformed um, as he's out of the spotlight. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I I think the rest of these sentiments, other than how you how the trustworthy ratings are on individual politicians, um, I think the rest of these findings still absolutely are valid for now. So we, we asked five policies as it relates to vote by mail. Um, and we're going to go through each of them, but we but I wanted to show you them all stacked up here together. We went through signature matching, counting ballots before election day. Then drop boxes, no excuse, BBM, and ballot harvesting. So what's interesting is, is that there's two policies as it relates to vote by mail that conservatives are all about, Republicans are all about, and then the rest of them go exactly in the opposite direction. Um, we'll go through first with signature matching. Do you support or oppose mail-in or absentee ballots being thrown out if the signature on the ballot does not match the one that the county has on file? 78% support. 67% strongly support. So there's very logical policy on the right that that should be done. Secondly, counting ballots before election day. Some states did not immediately have results on election day because they were not done counting mail or absentee ballots. Would you support or oppose allowing election staff to begin counting absentee, absentee and other early votes ahead of election day so that the results can be processed more quickly? 64% support that. Uh, to 30% opposition intensity, just over 40% at 41 uh, in this uh, in this survey. You look at Georgia, Georgia goes as high as 70 because they know they had a problem with that, not once, but twice. So Republicans are for uh, uh, canvassing, is how we call it in Florida, canvassing these ballots prior to election day so that the results come in a lot more streamlined and in a more what appears to be a controlled manner. Then we get into the rest of the, uh, the, the variables surrounding vote by mail or absentee. Drop boxes. In most states, voters could drop their mail or absentee ballot in a drop box instead of using the postal service. In general, do you support or oppose allowing voter drop box sites that give voters the option to submit their vote by mail ballot instead of mailing it in? A big hell no. 72% of the sample opposed that. 62% strongly oppose these drop boxes. The only distinction that we saw inside of the internals were essentially Mountain and Pacific Coast voters and Arizona at the very top. Support is actually at 36%, opposition just under 60. So the net is much healthier in that regard, but everywhere else pretty much uniformly oppose drop boxes. I don't think there's really any way around that this at this point. I don't think you can message out of drop boxes. There is a view on the right that these boxes somehow are fraudulent. I know in Florida right now, they're going through the processes of, of fixing some of the public policies. Can you provide, I just got a question up here. Can you provide some insight about opposition to the use of drop boxes? So I'll, I'll answer your question in this way. Um, if you think about it, there these drop boxes happened really fast. I mean, I, the state of Florida actually had legalized them uh, prior to the pandemic starting. And a lot of people in Florida don't even realize that 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 uh, that was they were gonna have drop boxes in 2020 uh, regardless. Um, obviously the president took an assault on it. So uh, so once he did that, a trustworthy score in the 80s, uh, you can see why um, voters would believe that. Uh, but practically speaking too, you have to remember for conservative voters, keep in context, they all prefer in-person voting. This idea of somebody dropping a mailbox into some, uh, or dropping a ballot into some box that in some places had somebody you know, watching it or guarding it and other places it didn't. Um, it just seems like it opens it up to fraud and there's great opposition to that. Um, that's about the best that I can do to illuminate that process. I mean, I, I don't want to go down the trail of a lot of conspiracy theories that aren't founded. Uh, but I will say this, a lot of conservatives ask the question, why is it that I have to show a voter ID when I go to vote in person, but yet somebody who votes by mail or and drops it in one of these boxes can just do it and go away. So they do see it as an issue of fairness um, and there's very little uh, messaging or ability to, to, to spin them out of that in my opinion. <clears throat> no excuse vote by mail. Uh, in some states, voters are allowed to cast ballots via mail regardless of whether they have a reason to or not. 
do you support or oppose a national policy that allows voters to vote by mail regardless if they have an excuse or not? 82% oppose, 73% strongly oppose. Keep in mind, we said a national policy. We didn't say a state-specific policy. This is a national policy that would require, that would allow people to vote by mail um, without excuse. It's just great opposition to that. And it's pretty uniform across the board, including states like Florida that currently has no excuse PBM, where 5 million or so ballots were cast uh, uh, via mail this cycle. 77% uh, opposed, of Republicans oppose uh, that national uh, policy. Question. I do, I do think it's interesting that when you look at the, the geographic breakdown here, that those regions that do have, you know, a little bit more experience with vote by mail do see a higher level of support than um, than other areas of the country. And so, you know, there is perhaps, I guess, some evidence that, um, you know, familiarity with the process does breed a little bit more support. Um, I also wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit slight, about... Um, slight, not much, but slight. Right, right, right. You know, maybe 10 to 15, 15 points. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the idea of, of counting ballots before election day and, and the degree to which um, you think that there's the ability to, um, I don't know, sway the electorate, I guess, on, the, on that issue. Um, you know, it seems like there's this clear bifurcation between those issues like drop boxes and, and you know, no excuse vote by mail where the president was adamantly opposed. And so as a result, the Republican electorate has sort of, you know, uh, soaked that in. But I wonder on some of these other issues, you know, where, where it's not, it, it seems like this was an issue that was specifically tied to the president. And so um, do you think that there's perhaps the ability to get support for uh, in, in a number of these states for, that don't have the ability currently to count, count ballots yeah. early? Yes, you got to tie it to the fact that it gets results in. You know, it, 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 take a look at the state of Florida. So the president won Florida by 300,000 some odd votes, 3% um, or so margin, 3% um, plus margin. Uh, if we would have done mail ballots in Florida, let's say we would have counted mail ballots in Florida, the way that they process them in states like Pennsylvania or Georgia, Wisconsin, a lot of these other states, what would have happened was is that everybody would have went to bed seeing the president of the United States up about 1.1 million votes when they went to bed, and then they would have woke up and it would have dropped down to 3%. That's how split the ideological preferences were on the use of, of voting in person versus by mail. I think when you logically explain to people that you've got to let these, this stuff be processed in a timely manner prior to election day, um, they logically understand that that needs to be done. Um, so yes, I do think that there's, there's hope there and you need to couch it just the way that, that we did here. That doesn't mean that they're going to support increased vote by mail, uh, but it does. I, I do think that it does help. Right. Question, asked, question was asked on drop boxes. Uh, if, uh, if the drop box is located in the county election office, are they still so strongly opposed uh, to drop boxes? Um, we didn't clarify that in here. The purpose of this survey wasn't trying to, to message uh, uh, how, to, how to clean up drop boxes. We're going to do that on a later project. Uh, I would tell you that my instinct is, is that if you say that it's at the county supervisor of elections office and it's monitored uh, you know, during business hours, and someone shows an ID when they drop a, bot, a mail ballot in there, I think you get plenty of support. I think you'll see re Republicans be okay with it. But I do think those three caveats are needed, or at least two of the three caveats are needed. And then ballot harvesting, this is something I can tell you in the overall electorate is not, it's not really, it's, it's frowned upon, not to the degree. Do you support or oppose allowing volunteers or campaign staff to collect ballots from voters and turn them into a polling location? 90% uh, opposition, uh, near universal opposition with the Republican base, 82% uh, intensity. Uh, and that's that, it, it, even in the overall electorate, um, uh, it, it's, it's, um, it, it's not like, not to this degree. Question is checking with the Washington Secretary of State, Kim Wyman on the use of drop boxes could be helpful on your assessment. Okay, sure, we're happy to do that. Same day voter registration. Do you support or oppose same day voter registration, which allows voters to show up to their local polling place on election day and register and vote at the same time? 66% of Republicans we surveyed said no, they're opposed to that. 57% intensity, only difference, and boy, was it a big one, the state of Wisconsin. 69% support, 26% opposed, uh, plus 43 net there. Uh, overall, the only remote close different distinction on that would have been the mountain uh, as well, mountain areas as well. A couple other policies we asked about redistricting, very neutral opinion on that. I don't think most people realize um, 
that that you know what redistricting is and 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 how important it is. Do you approve or disapprove of the way your state redraws its congressional and legislative boundaries during redistricting in your state? Fairly neutral, 31 approved, 36 percent disapproved. A lot of the disapproved comes from more blue areas of the country, as you can see, Pacific region, 55 percent disapproved. Also pointing out Pennsylvania as well. 55% uh, disapproved, so something different there. Pennsylvania obviously had some court cases uh, recently in their redistricting, so that might also be uh, on their mind. So the question is, at some point, can you show the cross tabs? We are doing that. These are cross tabs. These are uh, the ones that are on the right in the table. Uh, ideologically, they're all there, soft conservative, very conservative, um, moderates, age, race, which the Republican base is pretty largely white, um, age, pretty for the most part, fairly old. Um, and then we're doing the regions as well. So we are showing the relevant cross tabs, I believe in, our, in my opinion. Uh, we asked about an independent redistricting commission. Would you support or oppose redistricting conducted, being conducted in your state by a nonpartisan independent redistricting commission as done in other states? We did not ask that of states that already do the independent commission. And of those that, that don't have it, there's agreement, 57% support it, but it's fairly soft at 31% intensity. Um, so that very interesting finding there that the base would be up for that. I can tell you that if you want to pass a, a, an independent redistricting commission in your state, you basically just need to say that it's going to screw the politicians and you'll get plenty of enough Republicans to support that. Uh, electoral college versus popular vote. Uh, do you think we should continue to elect the president by electoral college where the electors from each state vote for the candidate who won the most votes in their state or by the popular vote where the candidate who gets the most votes in the country wins? Republicans get it. The only reason that they're remotely able to, to be in play in a national election is through the Electoral College. 72% are with the Electoral College, 65% uh, intensity. Uh, that's fairly uniform uh, across the bo board for the most part. Final question that we go over here, and I think this is probably perhaps the most important question as we move forward into election reforms. We asked the, the voters to agree or disagree with the following statement. The electoral system has become corrupt. A vote like mine probably doesn't get counted anyway. This is going to be a good tracking question as we move into the future. Now, right now, we're really, really close uh, to January 6th, to the election happening, to the inauguration. And 42% uh, of those surveyed agree with that statement, that a vote like mine probably doesn't get counted anyway. That's way too high, way too high. The goal is, is, is some common sense reforms can be brought forth. Um, specifically in key states in a place like Georgia, where we've already seen that there was a turnout deficit because of all of the doubt that was cast on the process by the president, former president. It'd be very interesting in time to see as these reforms are brought into play, can we get that agree number down? It'd be great to get into the midterms in 2022 and that number be half of what it is and, and you know, Lord willing, way less uh, than that. Uh, so we yes, have yeah, let me go ask ahead. you one question on that. I wonder how, how much, uh, you know, you've asked this question before and, and whether it may, may just be natural variability. You know, if you, independent of any reforms, you know, how might we expect these numbers to change the further away we get from the 2020 election? I've never tracked it that consistently. This is going to be the first time that I can actually do data to it. So uh, we need to know the answer to this question as time goes on. Um, I, I don't think uh, uh, that that in past elections you would have seen agreement anywhere near that high. Mm -hmm. You have to remember this was a record turnout. So turnout was really, really, really high. Mm -hmm. And this is a problem. There's too many people that agree um, with that. I think uh, that's a great place to end. We, uh, we completely agree with that at, at, at our street for sure. Um, I uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for uh, for joining us today and uh, and and talking talking us through this. I think it's very very eye opening. Uh, a lot of things we might have suspected, but uh, um, a lot of a lot of new data, I think for sure. So uh, thank you so much for that, and uh, have a good one. Um, we're going to actually transition over to talking with uh, Steve Greenhut. Uh, Steve is a, a senior fellow at R Street, as I mentioned at the top, and has a new uh, a new paper that I think is uh, very very interesting. Uh, the case against restricting voting access, and I think. You know, Steve, you talk about this from a sort of conservative or or right leaning perspective, and so you know maybe we should start off uh, talking a little bit about if you would summarize your your paper for us and and sort of the arguments that, that you make. Uh, let's, let's let's start there. Okay, great, great. I uh, you know listening to Ryan, uh, we might conclude that uh, conservative voters want to make it more difficult for people to vote, and I, I think that's fundamentally 
a non-conservative uh, principle. And uh, in our paper, we, we, we pretty much review the way the states are trying to, uh, some of the Republicans in state legislatures are trying to impose uh, new restrictions on voting that conform very similar, similarly to what uh, Ryan had discussed. So I, I was looking at an op-ed today from, uh, uh, it's called Election Integrity is a National Imperative. It's from former Vice President Mike Pence. And he was arguing against a, uh, a federal election bill. And he made a couple of reasonable points based on the issues of federalism. But I, I kind of spit out my coffee, you know, after reading this graph here. Polling shows that large numbers of Democrats did not trust the outcome of the 2016 election, and that large numbers of Republicans did not trust the outcome of the 2020 election. We have to do everything we can to change that and ensure that the American people, no matter which political party they favor, have confidence in the fairness and security of the election process. Sounds pretty banal, but you know, in 2016, the Democratic candidates pretty quickly accepted the results of the election. And in 2020, Pence and Donald Trump refused to accept them and spent months undermining the integrity of the election by making baseless claims about election fraud, which I think Ryan's data suggests that they were pretty successful in uh, convincing people. So, so now the former vice president demands state action to combat that non-existent fraud because, well, people he told not to trust the election results don't trust the election results. So I think that's what we're seeing now. And what I detailed on the paper is the state legislatures, the Republican uh, officials are, are responding to that, that campaign. So, you know, if, if Pence and others want to restore uh, trust in, in, in state elections, they should stop making false claims about the, the last one. So I agree that it's a problem, but I, I just wonder, uh, to what degree, what are we supposed to do uh, when the problem is caused by, by things that just don't seem to be true? I mean, uh, um, so Republicans, as you pointed out, Jonathan, in the beginning here, Republicans did remarkably well across the, across the country. Uh, they did great in uh, state legislatures and, and in Congress. I'm um, in California and in Orange County, they grabbed a couple uh, congressional seats back from Democrats. They did great. One, Repub one particular Republican did not do well, the one at the top of the ticket, which I, I, you know, it's not, not that surprising. I think Democrats have, uh, was it seven out of the eight last elections won the popular vote. So um, it's, it, it's jumping to the fraud conclusion isn't, isn't the logical one. So Pence noted that America has a, a long, well-documented history of election fraud. And, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia and, uh, you know, followed things in Chicago. So I, I know uh, I, I know that to be true. But the nation also has a long, well-documented history of voter suppression, especially in the South. So, um, you know, you know, if you look at if you have to wait for hours to vote, uh, that's a, that's a form of voter suppression. Right. And if uh, and we and we know uh, and I detail in the paper quite a bit about some of the uh, you know, some of, some of the past laws in the, in the South in particular that were designed to make it difficult uh, or intimidate African-American voters away from voting. Now, after I wrote the paper, I've been, I, I've been lambasted by a few folks who said, uh, you know, I, I accept the fact that there's always going to be some non-systemic fraud in an election with 170 million ballots. But I, I, I get this response of, well, we shouldn't tolerate any, any, uh, you know, any fraud whatsoever. And I, and I don't, but, you know, we, we have to operate in the real world. I'd like a world where there's no uh, fraud of any kind or, or theft or murder, but, you know, it's, a, it's the human condition. But we didn't see any systemic fraud in the election. And um, uh, so anyway, most of these reforms that are being preferred, uh, uh, you know, being offered, um, they're just going to reduce the ability of people to, to vote. So some of the things like Pennsylvania Republicans are are talking about uh, audits. Now, I, I don't know their intent, but it looks like more of sprint, that they're more like springboards to discuss some of these discredited theories uh, that the former president has, has promoted. Now, a legitimate audit, there's nothing wrong with that, but those sorts of things I think are just, we're just using it as a political tool. Uh, but mainly we're seeing two things as, as we detail in the paper. Uh, eliminating or reducing no excuse absentee voting. And uh, Ryan discussed that quite a bit. 34 states allow, every state allows absentee voting. 34 allow it for no excuse at all. Uh, I live in uh, California where, you know, in Sacramento County and, 
And of course, we don't need an excuse. And I don't want an excuse. I don't want to have to go to the registrar of voters and, and uh, file an excuse. If I want to vote, um, I, I should vote. And um, anyway, so, so that's the main thing that they're trying to do. But there's no evidence that uh, expanded voting protocols of absentee voting had, had led to any sort of systemic fraud problems in states like Oregon, which have had since 2000, they've had an all male uh, voting um, has had, had an infinitesimal amount of fraud, less than the kind of fraud you not amount of fraud that you get in a normal uh, in person voting. So um, the other the other reform that they're proposing is eliminating ballot drop boxes. And Ryan went into a good bit of detail about that. Around here, I mean, we have a drop box that's in a uh, in a, a uh, auto repair shop, and uh, there are drop boxes at, at interesting places that. Uh, but but there haven't been any problems with the official ballot drop boxes, so we just don't see any evidence of it. Even if it even if you think, well, how safe is is it at the local repair shop? But uh, it, it appears to be safe. And you know, I, I, I want to bring up the suppression issue. Uh, you know, because on ballot boxes, uh, some states like Texas allow only one uh, ballot uh, box per county. Uh, Brewster County, Texas, is approximately the size of Connecticut and Rhode Island combined. So if your reforms force you to drive two hours to drop off a ballot or, uh, you know, then, then that's that's a form of voter suppression. Right. And um, and conservatives had uh, Republican legislators had had questioned whether the post office was able to handle all the new vote by mail. And yet they want to reduce the, the ability to drop off ballots, you know, in drop boxes. So um, what, what do we do about it? Uh, well, uh, you know, 50 plus Trump election related lawsuits failed. I, this week it took the Supreme Court, what, eight words to reject Sidney Powell's latest lawsuit. Um, you know, what, what do we do? I, I'm a writer and a think tanker, not a psychologist. But when people are delusional, you generally don't play along with their delusions. And, and it's certainly not in ways that make it worse for other people, right? If we, if we play along and we reduce uh, the ability of people to vote, that's going to hurt other people and reduce their ability to exercise their franchise. But I think we should be open to realistic reforms based on evidence. Uh, Michigan, for instance, just completed a zero margin risk limiting audit. Uh, it included a hand recount of ballots in one county where irregularities were alleged. And, and they can get a statewide audit and no surprises, they confirmed the accuracy of the election. But there's nothing to actually audit the election and not to trade in, in theories that, that make a partisan point. So, um, you, know, you know, that's that's the bottom line on the, on the paper. We, we pretty much uh, uh, just review some of the some of the specific proposals, look at a little bit of the history of, of uh, voter fraud and suppression in the country. And uh, we also did a paper back in June called the conservative case for expanded access to absentee ballots. And that one goes into, into more detail about uh, the history and traditions of absentee balloting in the, in the country. So those might be, uh, that one might be helpful also. So Steve, let's talk a little bit about um, the, I guess the philosophy here. I mean, you know, I, I would make the argument that, you know, voter drop boxes or no excuse um, absentee voting is very much consistent with conservative principles. In fact, you know, I think n none of us really want a government that's large enough where you have to go to the government and get permission to be able to vote. And so um, I wonder if you might just expand on that a little bit and, and talk about, you know, what what you think is the, the strongest conservative argument for um, for maintaining, you know, no excuse absentee balloting um, and, and, and drop boxes. Well, you know, conservatives were, were supposed to be based, focused on evidence. And I, I think there's the, the, the goal should be allowing as many people to vote as possible who want to vote. And, and, and of course, we, we want to have, uh, have election security. That's important. But, but this idea that the Republican Party is, is focused on reducing opportunities to vote, that certainly uh, uh, doesn't make the case for, uh, you know, responsible, limited government, democratic involvement in the process. So, yeah, I, I think we should want more people to vote if they want to vote um, and make it easier for them to do so, provided they're legitimate voters and uh, do so in a, in a secure way. But there isn't evidence that absentee voting has led to any sort of problem. So we, we should be focused on on evidence. So so if there's no evidence to, to suggest um, a systemic problem, then 
then we should make it easier to vote. I mean, here, I, I thought it was interesting, Ryan's data, as we go further, uh, farther west, uh, there's less resistance, even, even among Republicans, uh, to mail-in voting. And that's because we've been doing it here for a long time. Um, in, in Sacramento County, yeah, I think it's true throughout, throughout California, you can track your ballot just like you're, you're tracking a UPS package. I mean, that seems like a pretty uh, secure process. And um, uh, anyway, that's, uh, um, uh, that's what I'm thinking uh, in terms of uh, re Republicans ought to be endorsing those sorts of things. Uh, another another argument I think you know for a long time that has existed is that uh, Republicans were harmed by higher turnout and that you know greater turnout in general was just beneficial to Democrats and yet you know setting aside the presidential this time um, you know we saw record high turnout and Republicans picking up seats and in, in in the House and so um, I wonder if you might be able to shed a little light on that about the the relationship between. Um, between turnout and what it might mean for some of these outcomes. And, and I guess to extend that even further, you know, how that might change the perspective of the Republican electorate, because I think you could make a case here that, that you know, to the degree that some of these proposals that we're seeing would end up, you know, restricting, um, uh, you know, or make it more difficult for people to vote, um, that would lower turnout and could arguably actually harm Republicans more than Democrats to the degree that, that greater turnout could be beneficial. So I don't know if there's any, uh, you know, data or, or um, if you have any, any further thoughts on, on that argument. Yeah, well, I, I, I think the, uh, the idea that Repub Republicans ought to be extremely optimistic about the 2020 election uh, because of how, how, how well they did uh, throughout you know, throughout the state legislatures, they, I don't believe they lost any, uh, any legislatures uh, they gained in the House of Representatives. Uh, they held their own in the Senate until the special election. Um, and I, I saw uh, Republicans did quite well here in California. They, they, they had some great inroads and that was in, in an election with record levels of turnout and that had implemented a lot of these uh, uh, absentee balloting reforms. So just, you know, I, I don't, I haven't analyzed that in any sort of statistical way, but I think if you're if you're you know in the business of politics and you look at that and you say, well, obviously uh, uh, higher vote turnouts is is not going to hurt Republican opportunities. So so instead of cre creating this atmosphere that the only way for them to uh, to win is to is to reduce uh, voter opportunities, I think that's a I think that's a bad look, and I, I don't think it's it's helpful. Uh, to Republicans, so uh, you know, I, I think they they can win, and they just didn't win at the at the presidential level, and and that's uh, you know, and as I mentioned before, that seems to reflect a a general trend over over the past several elections in terms of uh, popular vote. So uh, uh, you know, maybe they need to focus more on messaging than on uh, trying to to change the 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 number of people who can vote. We um we got a question that is on a related but somewhat different topic, which is um, you know, what you think and, and what you know the Republican electorate might think about other proposed election reforms, things like uh, uh, open primaries or or ranked choice voting. And I know that's outside the scope of this this paper, but I wonder if you might have any um, any thoughts on some of these other reforms that have been you know that have been out there. Yeah, I mean we have uh, top two. We have the top two primary in California. So, uh, you know, the, that has shifted uh, the focus from the general election in many ways to the, to the uh, uh, primary, where it's a jungle primary and everyone, regardless of party, uh, participates and the top two go on. So we've ended up with a number of elections with, um, uh, you know, just like one Republican against another, mostly one Democrat against another. I, I, I never have loved it. Uh, I think people are... Uh, are working within that system, regardless of, of party, it's just the new rules. I don't believe that rejiggering the rules is necessarily, uh, you know, is necessarily uh, the, the best. I, I guess, what, what is it we're trying to, to, to achieve should be the goal. And I, I don't think that any election reform should be geared around a specific outcome. And my big problem with top two was that proponents, their main goal was to get more moderates elected to reduce the, uh, you know, the, the, the liberalism of, of the Democrats and the conservatism of the Republicans. And um, it's, it's uh, mixed, um, you know, some mixed results, but uh, uh, 
uh, anyway, I, I don't think that's really a valid or valid goal. So uh, I, I haven't really looked at ranked choice, but that's one of the things that uh, that I need to look at. I, I find these election reforms to be interesting, but what's the goal of them? I guess is 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 what I'd ask of any one of those uh, election reforms. Whether uh, you know what, what what are we trying to achieve here? Yeah, and I think um, for what it's worth, you know, Catherine Gale has written uh, extensively on this, and obviously there was, uh, you know, Alaska now uh, passing the uh, both ranked choice voting in the general election, but also top four in the primary. So it would be quite interesting, I think, to see how um, Alaska in particular changes going forward. And I think there's a lot of merit to, um, you know, some of these ideas being being paired together. And we will, for what it's worth, be uh, uh, be having an event, uh, not public yet, but uh, um, discussing uh, that topic specifically. Um, you know, Jonathan, I, could, yeah, I wanted to mention one thing uh, before, uh, you know, ballot harvesting, Ryan, Ryan had uh, pointed to an overwhelming opposition to ballot harvesting, which I, I'm strongly opposed to that. And in the paper, we, we made that point because ballot harvesting where interested parties, you know, party members, uh, union activists can collect ballots from other people. That does open the door to intimidation, right? Because you could get a group of people together, and then you're handing the ballot over to interested parties. Uh, and I, I don't, I don't trust that process. California is the only state that allows it widely, thanks to a, a, a law that Jerry Brown had signed in 2016. And ironically, it was the and it's mainly benefited Democrats and and their alliances with with public sector unions, but. Uh, this year, uh, the Republican Party got caught setting up ballot their own ballot boxes that are meant to mimic the official ballot boxes, and they put them in, in front of party headquarters. It turns out, uh, you know, it, that was a, a legal thing to do, but I think that's troubling to have parties set up, uh, you know, drop boxes that imitate official drop boxes, and then they take control of the ballots. And uh, I think that's a it's a it's a bad process in states that want to preemptively stop that from happening. I, I agree with uh, wholeheartedly because that that does seem like an invitation to abuse. Mm -hmm. We've um, we've gotten a couple of questions on sort of our thoughts on on you know a couple of reforms that have been proposed. Uh, one being the Voting Rights Advancement Act, and the other being the For the People Act, and sort of what um, you know our perspective and, and your perspective, Steve, might might be. Uh, you know, I will I will share. Uh, you know, my colleague Anthony Markham and I uh, recently just this week actually authored a a new explainer on the For the People Act and why uh, we are uh, in particular opposed. Um, you know, I will share my opinion and I. I Suspect you might agree with this, Steve. That you know there are a number of issues with that piece of legislation. One is that you know it does ultimately federalize legislation, um, which is something that I think actually weakens the electoral integrity of our entire system. I mean, part of the reason that you know we have had so few problems uh, from, from an electoral standpoint is that uh, you know we don't have this power centralized in one place where it's easy for someone to go and um, you know, or a nefarious actor to go and and, and manipulate that system for uh, personal or political gain. And so. So uh, the idea of increasingly federalizing elections, I think, is a misguided notion. Even if some of the uh, some of the uh, you know actual reforms might be okay if they were implemented at the proper level, like say the state or local level. Um, the other big problem with the For the People Act, for what it's worth, as I see it, is that uh, you know it, it of course would restrict free speech in many ways. I mean, there there are huge. Uh, new regulations and burdens that are placed on, um, you know, nonprofit organizations like our street that engage in the policy process, but uh, all sorts of, you know, individuals and, um, and, and other sort of organizations. And I think that that's particularly problematic because, um, you know, while the bill is sold as sort of getting money out of politics, what happens is that it increases the burden and only those large organizations that are able to um, get to actually go and, and you know comply with those new requirements are the ones who are able to have their voices heard in the political system and so from my standpoint I think that uh, you know I, I, putting aside you know the, the concerns about a chilling effect which I think also can be very significant uh, the other problem that I see is that you know, just uh, being able to comply means that only those people with, you know, big, uh, big legal departments are going to be able to increasingly have their voices heard in the in the political process. And I think that that's very antithetical to, um, you know, the First Amendment and, and the history of, of, of elections in this country. And so, you know, my, my perspective, and I think our street's perspective is that it should be easier to vote. Uh, and it should also be easier to talk about who you're voting for. And, um, you know, HR1 in that context, uh, uh, I think is a step in the, in, in the wrong direction. But I don't know, Steve, if you have anything you'd, you'd like to add to that or, or maybe even disagree. 
No, I agree. I agree completely with that. And, uh, you know, that that piece I started talking about with Pence was opposing that act. And I, and I agree with his opposition, especially on grounds of federalism. I, I just had trouble with some of his uh, uh, explanations about uh, voting, uh, you know, the, the, the lack of the, the increased concern of, uh, of the integrity of elections. But yeah, that's a, a terrible idea. And, and elections should be uh, locally based. So, um, uh, you know, local officials, not federal officials. And, and, and all of these sorts of uh, ideas that try to get money out of politics, it never works. Money's like water rolling down a hill. It always finds its way uh, somehow through some sort of super PAC or new workaround. So uh, yeah, I agree with you completely. Steve, we're getting toward the end of our time, but I wonder if we could just talk a little bit more about some of the reforms that have been proposed and you know, maybe if there are some places of, of optimism that you see. Uh, and so um, I just wonder if uh, you, know, you might talk about, are there, are there states where there are measures that we might uh, you know, uh, view as a step in the right direction? Are there areas that you think are particularly um, worrisome in terms of what's being proposed at the state level? What's sort of the, the lay of the land at the moment? Yeah. I, I, I mean, the main thing is, as I pointed out, there were the, there are two areas I'm most concerned about efforts to uh, eliminate no excuse absentee voting, which is it's not a problem. It hasn't been a problem. Uh, and uh, so uh, the ballot box issue also, I, I don't I don't really see the point in that. It's just going to make it more difficult for people to vote, whether that's the intent or not. It's sure uh, it, it, those two items. Um, some of the auditing I don't have a problem with, uh, provided it's done, you know, the intent is to, you know, some of this, this, uh, like the Michigan audits, uh, that's a good idea. Some of those, those audits are, are, are a good idea. And of course, as uh, the ballot, uh, any sort of restrictions on, on ballot harvesting, uh, I'm supportive of that. My biggest concern is just the idea that is what Ryan presented, the idea that there's this widespread belief that the election was 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 uh, essentially rigged and the idea of those that the large percentage of voters who say people like my votes don't count anyway uh, you know that sense that that suggests a deep uh, lack of trust in in our democratic system and I think that has a I, I don't know what you do about that but that has uh, long-term ramifications yeah, I think if I, you know, if I have a takeaway from from the polling data, I mean, you know, Ryan spoke multiple times about this idea of there being a half life, um, and so, you know, I am if there's a, a source of optimism in that in that data for me, um, you know, it might be that the further away we get from the election, I think that, um, you know, the the, the more level headed people will be on both sides of the aisle. Um, you know, now, you know, I think there are many Republicans who would argue that that Democrats may, may not have been as always level headed during during the Trump administration. There's always going to be these these sort of partisan um, uh, you know realities uh, that that both sides are going to are going to um, utilize. But I think that you know, to some degree, I think that, you know, we're, we're likely to see a, um, a move away from what, ha what clearly are very extreme polling numbers at, at, at the moment. And I do think that some of the reforms that are being talked about, you know, will be helpful and, and could end up restoring trust, um, you know, not just among Republicans, but, uh, you know, across the, uh, the electorate broadly. And so, you know, that, of course, remains to be seen. But, uh, uh, you know, I always try to always try to see that glass as half full rather than uh, rather than half empty. But, um, I want to thank you, Steve, again for uh, for talking about the paper. Um, you know, the links were in the chat for anyone who is interested. Uh, very much appreciate everyone tuning in today. I uh, hope this was helpful to uh, just talk about uh, you know where the Republican electorate stands and uh, and just some of our thoughts on uh, um, on on potential areas for reform. So uh, thank you again, Steve. Thank you for Ryan uh, for joining us. And uh, um, as I mentioned, we will continue to have a number of events um, on these topics going forward. So uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks.